May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts together find their way into the heart of God this morning. Amen. Those who say, I love God, and hate their sisters and their brothers are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. So beloved, our worship of God is so limited. It is limited only by our inability to embrace the people we are least inclined to love. Can I get an amen? amen. So this is a poem called Accident Mass Ave, and it's by Jill McDonough. And I have edited out the swear words because as you know, I never swear. <laughs> good Christian woman. <laughs> Lindsay, don't laugh that hard. That's ridiculous. I am, and I never swear. Okay. Here's the poem. I stopped at a red light on Mass Ave in Boston, a couple of blocks away from the bridge, and a woman with a beat-up old Buick backed into me, like cranked her wheel, rammed into my side. I drove a Chevy pickup truck. It being Boston, I got out of the car yelling, swearing at this woman, a little woman, whose first language was not English, but she lived and drove in Boston too, so she knew, we both knew, that the thing to do is to get out of the car, slam the door as hard as you bleepin' can, and yell things like, what the bleep were you thinking? You bleepin' blind? What the bleep is going on? So we swore at each other with perfect posture, unnaturally angled chins. I threw my arms around in sudden jerking motions with my whole arms, the backs of my hands toward where she had hit my truck. But she hadn't hit my truck. She hit the tire. No damage done. <laughs> and her car was fine too. We saw this while we were still yelling, and then we were stuck. <laughs> the next line in our little drama should have been, look at this bleeping dent, I'm not paying for this, I'm calling the cops lady, maybe we'd throw in a you're in big trouble sister, or I just hope for your sake there's nothing wrong with my bleeping suspension, that sort of thing but there was no bleep and dent. There was nothing else for us to do. So I stopped yelling, and she looked at the tire she'd backed into, her little eyebrows pursed and worried. She was clearly in the wrong. I was enormous, and I'd been acting as if I'd like to hit her. So I said, well, there's nothing wrong with my car, nothing wrong with your car. Are you okay? She nodded and started to cry. So I put my arms around her and held her, middle of the street, Mass Ave, Boston, a couple of blocks from the bridge. I hugged her and I said, we were scared, weren't we? And she nodded. And we laughed. Here ends the poem. That's revolutionary love, isn't it? The fear that's overcome by wonder. Are you okay? the embrace, getting some skin in the game, the recognition of each other's wound, the desire to tend it, 
even the hilarity that follows the laughing. If the love revolution is joyless drudgery, I want no part of it, amen? (laughs) If we are going to learn how to love as God loves, we need to be bold enough to flip the script. To flip the script we were given, even on Mass Ave in Boston, even in traffic, especially when we're scared. Our scripture, as usual, beckons us to be fearless. There is no fear in love, it says. To love as God loves, we must cultivate what Sister Simone Campbell calls a holy curiosity, even, especially, for the people we most fear. A holy curiosity. When John the Evangelist, who writes our letter from 1 John, urges us to love, he means the kind of love that flips the fear script, the kind that calls us to use our bodies not to harm but to embrace, the kind of love that demands that we see every human we encounter as God with skin on. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God, his letter to the early Christian community says. Love one another, every single other. Each, each is an opportunity to know God better than we could ever know God on our own. So remember from last week that John's letter was written around 990 to 110 AD and aims to explain the early Christian community, or to the early Christian community in Ephesus, why it is significant that Jesus came in the actual flesh. He was countering docetism, that idea that Jesus only came as spirit. It matters, it is significant that Jesus came as flesh, John wants to tell us that Jesus came as God with skin on to show us with his very human body what love is. To show us that love is not something we feel, but something we do. Something we do with our bodies. God put skin in the game because we just weren't getting it. We thought following God meant following the rules. We thought following God meant surrounding ourselves with people just like us so we could keep each other pure and honest, right? And then God blew our minds by sending us Jesus. Jesus who broke all the rules. Jesus who surrounded himself with all the wrong people. Jesus who moved into the neighborhood and used his body to embrace the people we most fear. Jesus who went to the borders and welcomed the alien, the refugee, the stranger, the outcast. Jesus who embraced the poor. Jesus who healed the sick, who touched the untouchables, who set the captives free. Jesus who showed us with his flesh how to treat the stranger as a piece of ourselves we do not yet know. Jesus, the word made flesh. And so it is a great honor to welcome 38 more opportunities to know God in the flesh. Katie, Waltz, Larry, Liza, Kate, Matt, Madeline, Vinny, Rachel. I didn't get to hug you, but I meant to. She was sitting over here because she's about to have this baby. (laughs) Matt, Piper, Kit in utero. Any day now will come out and bless us. Betsy, Kathy, Susan, Alan, Pat, Sarah, Cecilia, Liam, Amanda, Dan, Andy, Nathaniel. Are you up in the balcony somewhere? You usually are. (laughs) David, Susan, Peter, Shana, Delaney, Lillian, Adeline, Nancy, Claudia, Bob, Dave, Betty, 
Ron, finally. <laughs> and Sean, who's sitting right next to him. We are so humbled you have chosen to call us home, beloved. We are so lucky. Getting to know you will be our most important spiritual practice as a congregation. Because you contain a piece of God that we do not yet know. And so we want to know you. We bless you because joining a church is a profoundly risky thing to do. Some of us forget that. You are flipping the fierce script and we honor your bravery. First of all, it's countercultural these days to join a church. You are joining a church in the middle of the great American mass exodus from American organized religion. <laughs> You're going the wrong way. <laughs> Every statistic says that you shouldn't be here today, especially if you are under, well, 60. So congratulations for being a rebel <laughs> and joining up with an organized religion not before it was cool, but after it was cool. There's got to be extra hipster points for that. If you want, I will give you things to say when your friends and family question all your life choices. <laughs> Like, yes, it is a church, but it's not that kind of church. <laughs> That's a good line. I, I, st I still use that as the pastor. <laughs> yes, I'm a pastor, but not that kind of pastor. Second, joining a church is an emotionally and spiritually risky thing to do. It is terrifying to trust a flawed human institution with your tender hearts. Many of you are joining us after being irreparably harmed by other religious institutions or because you feel lost at sea and need an anchor or because you are deep in mourning. Beloved, you are heroic just for dipping a toe in the water, much less diving right in. You are taking a huge leap of faith into a future yet unwritten. And I am so blessed, as you all will be, to have gotten to know each and every one of you to varying degrees in different ways. And I know this, you are all here for profound reasons that some of you have trouble even putting into words. The tears you so often shed tell more of the story than the words ever could, amen? I suspect you are all here for the same reason the rest of us are, because of our heart's deepest longing to be known and to be loved exactly as we are. So thank you, new members, for trusting us with such a tender job. Congregation, let's do our best not to screw it up too much, okay? Okay. <laughs> So I want to say two things to all of us, because we all need this reminder about what a church is, but I'm going to tell you first what a church is not, okay? Okay? Our newest members tell me many things about why they first came, right? And it's often because of our outreach and our educational programs for children and adults. And we are so glad that we have so many entrance points for engagement, but a church is not the programs. And some of you walked in for the first time because of the beauty of the historic New England church on the green. And this building is no doubt beautiful. But if it burned down tomorrow, we would still be church. Amen? Amen. Because a church is not the building. A lot of our newest members tell me that they came to this church after reading or watching my sermons online. And they continue to come every week, they say, for me, thank you. I am clearly charming and hilarious <laughs> and very humble. <laughs> and Megan is even more so. But the church is definitely not the pastors. It is not. It is not the pastors. Some of you come because you love the worship service, you love Rana, 
We sing your favorite hymns. We are liberal enough in our theology to embrace you and your doubts, but we still wear robes, right, and have a little bit of tasteful stained glass. And we don't have screens or rock bands. But the church is not its style either. It's not even its beliefs. What is it? The church is what? The the people, it's us. That's right. It's all of these amazing, beautiful, banged up, mishmash of people, right? It is us. These people, all of these people, the people we serve in the community too, and most especially the people who have not yet come through our doors, amen? So I want to invite you new members today to get to know and love these people, these people just as they are, and please let them get to know and love you. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us. And his love is perfected in us. God has given us a gift. So don't squander it, right? Also a word of caution. These people may disappoint you because they are people. I will certainly disappoint you, especially if you have me up on a higher pedestal than the rest. Stick around when that happens. Really, to see how God redeems that mess. Because here we believe in love, even when we fail to act like it, and sometimes we do. And if love hasn't won yet, it is not the end. Okay? Another word of caution Lots of people join churches that they perceive to be full of like-minded people. Right? Wrong place. (laughs) Kathy yelled out, wrong place, for those of you who didn't hear But people do that for good reason. They want to be around people who agree with them. It feels good. It feels safe. But we are not a group of like-minded people. Even better than that. We are a group of like-hearted people. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. John Wesley reminds us that we need not think alike to love alike. We share the same heart, which is so much better and more edifying than sharing the same brain, yes? Make no mistake about it. This kind of loving, ideologically, and theologically diverse community is what will save the world, right? Yes. Yes. Especially in these hot mess times. So perhaps most importantly of all, the church is the mission. You've joined these people on a mission to love the hell out of this world. Congratulations. Now get out your, you know, helmets. (laughs) And most importantly, show up for it. Who was it that said that 90% of life is just showing up, right? Show up as often as you can with your full self, blessed and broken. You will be better equipped to lead the love revolution with food for the spirit, with hands to hold, and with a lot of practice. So, beloved, take risks. Fear not. Wonder more. Recognize and tend the wound in others and in yourselves. Remember that we can do hard things together. Trust in the character and generosity of people because often they rise to the occasion. Use this church as a training ground for God's reign of love on earth. Nothing less. And then go out and enact it in the world. Love the way God loves you, which means putting some serious skin in the game. Welcome. We knew you from before you arrived because we knew that you were named Beloved. Amen.